Welcome to Average Joe's Drive. Your weekly podcast for movies, music, games, and other things entertainment related. Now, your host, DJ Washburn. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Average Joe's Drive In. I am your host, TJ Washburn, and with me is Amanda Call. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. We're having some uh, Skype issues that I hopefully we have resolved. <laughs> so, been fighting with that and uh yeah. So, why don't you uh tell everybody a little bit about yourself and what you do? Hello, everyone. I am Amanda Call. I am the writer and artist and creator of Age of Night, which is a webcomic, a big epic fantasy story. And also, I do lots of work in the tabletop gaming industry. So I'm the art director for Fearlight Games, and I do a lot of freelance illustrating for tons of other game companies as well. Very interesting. Um, now... Um First question, I guess, is how, what gets you into art in the first place? You know, like starting way back at the beginning, like what was the catalyst? Of all turning, the way, <laughs> all, all the, the way back. All the way back to like <laughs> three years old, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, well, I always, it was always something that I enjoyed and had some natural aptitude for. Um, I sometimes jokingly say that I blame my mom where she would, uh, try to get me out of her hair by taking construction paper and folding it into a little booklet and being like, here, go draw me a story. And so then I'd go and draw and write little stories, and it really just never stopped from there. <laughs> it just kept going. Yeah, I, I got to get that, because my, uh, my mom did a lot of the same stuff with me when I was a kid. She just was like, um, yeah... Uh, <laughs> here, leave me alone while I'm doing things, go draw. <laughs> right. So, yeah, right. yeah, I used to make my little flip books, and then I would, like, tell the stories out on a tape and, you know, do, like, the, at the beep, turn the page type thing, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> I think that was, like, the go-to for moms, you know. That, that's, like, a go-to. <laughs> right. now, now, you have kids. Do you do the same thing with them? Um, I'm starting to now with the, the oldest one is just now four, so he's actually at that point where he'll take that kind of direction. The the younger one is only two, so not, not, much, get, not much gets him to leave me alone. <laughs> right, right. Um, so um, tell me a little bit about Age of Night. I mean, I'm fairly familiar with it, but <laughs> for the people that are listening, you know, tell right. them a little bit about Age of Night and what it's all about and how you came about doing that project. Right, so Age of Night is a fantasy story. It's an in the vein of the epic quest type story. Uh, it's about a group of friends who are trying to free one of them from a reincarnation cycle that makes him a slave to the church in their world and has turned him into a house cat. And so along the way, they're, they face all sorts of different adventures and dangers, and you have magic and ninjas and giant cat monsters and all sorts of fun adventure. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's quite a that's quite a like a load of stuff going on. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. So uh, how um, how long have you been how long have you been doing Age of Night? I know it's been quite a quite a while, hasn't it? Right. Actually, as of right now, it's been about ten years because oh. uh, yeah, initially I developed the concept while I was in college as actually one of my projects for school. I have a degree in sequential art, which is a fancy term for having a degree in comics. Um, <laughs> so so I took a concept development class, and I f fleshed out the concept for that class, and then I did the first chapter as my senior project, which was my requirement to graduate. So that's how I kicked it off, and then it went live online in January of 2008. Oh wow! So it's been yeah. it's been online. It's for, been <laughs> yeah, almost ten years now. Wow, that's pretty impressive for any project to go on that long, you know, and consistently. Now you do you do like a page a week, roughly? Is about usually yes. what you upload? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, usually a page a week. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I I understand. I completely unless, understand how that goes. Stuff. <laughs> Things happen. Life, unfortunately, it's the way right. sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, took, took a couple little breaks after each one of my kids was born. That sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. You know, 
Now, I guess this is this might be kind of a weird question, but has having kids changed the way you approach your stories at all, or you know, giving you like a different perspective on things? Um, there's not an awful lot in this story that has as much to do with younger children, so probably not as much. Um, and it's not really aimed at younger children either. It's right. mostly <laughs> right. I mean, I, people see that it's fantasy, and they're like, oh, is this for little kids, or is this like Game of Thrones? I'm like, no, it's somewhere in between. It's what? not really for little kids. It's not really grimdark either. Right. I guess I guess I needed to rephrase my question, because that didn't come out the way I, I guess I intended either. Okay. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm talking about more as, like, as an artist, not necessarily geared towards Age of Night, but has that changed your, like, approach to art, like, as... Seeing things like your kids are into and what gets them excited. Is that like giving you ideas or made you like, I don't have kids, so I have no idea. <laughs> you know? Right. <laughs> um. Yeah, sometimes it really does, especially like the my four-year-old comes out with stuff sometimes that I'm just like, I don't even know what that means. I don't know where you came up with that, but that's a really cool idea. And I think I'm going to run with that. Yeah. <laughs> Kids, kids come up with some of the coolest, like, out there stuff, and they're kids, so they don't have that preconceived notion, I guess, of what's been done already or what, right? They, yeah. Or what's cool and what isn't cool. They just that's what they think of, and it pops out. I always thought it would be kind of an interesting concept. To I, I can't remember there was a there was like a, a newspaper comic artist that used to like. His uh, son would draw his comic occasionally for him, and it was, I can't remember if it was Family Circle or something weird like that, but I always thought, like, a cool idea would be for somebody to take, like, little stories their kids told and, like, turn them into, like, a comic series. I know I've seen artists. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've seen artists do that with, like, uh, there's the guy that does the renditions of their kids' yep. drawings, and then they, like, really make them super-duper fancy, and it's really cool looking. But, yep. Uh, yeah. I think that wasn't um, Axe Cop written with the kids, with the guy's kid. Like, the kid actually came up with the story, and he just, like, turned it into an actual real comic. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but that... I, I was going to say, I can't imagine somebody has in like, right. I'm pretty sure it was... concept, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Axe Cop, but I could be wrong. Yeah. But... Well, Fact check us, listeners. Find out. Um, now, like, I I met you through the Comic Con and comic book convention circuit, and I didn't even realize you were from the same. Well, like, went to school in the same hometown as I did till like after the fact, actually, right? <laughs> which was kind of weird, you know. But uh, so. I've talked to a few of my friends that, you know, I, I talked to Sean French recently. I think you know Sean that does Escape from Jesus Island. and Yeah. Um, we were talking about, you know, just the convention thing, and, and I noticed you, you are very popular at the convention. You always seem to have, like, a crowd around you. And um, How has the comic convention thing helped with promoting Age of Night and getting the word out there for you? Has that been a, a, a big positive or kind of just there or this is something you enjoy doing? You know, what's your whole take on that? Because I, I hear different stories from different people about their feelings on the whole Comic-Con thing, so. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they, the most exposure I've gotten for my webcomic has probably been from going to comic conventions. Like most of the most of the way anybody hears about it is from me being at a comic convention and talking their ear off about it from behind my table. So it's definitely been worthwhile. But I can also it I can also see why some people might be slightly disgruntled because it's a lot of work. Long days, <laughs> comic, long days. Yeah, com <laughs> comic conventions are exhausting and if you go to ones that are outside of, like, a drive from your home, which we live in Maine, there aren't that many. Like, there's a lot more than there used to be, but there aren't that many comic conventions within a drive of our homes. Yeah. Uh, it can be really expensive. Like, if you have to get a hotel somewhere and you have to travel somewhere and the table fees and everything else, like... That's been so one, of, one of my big hurdles in attending some of the ones outside of the state is trying to figure out the logistics to actually, you know, go pay for your gas, your food, your lodging, oh God, all that yeah. stuff. It's like 
It's like almost like trying to plan a vacation around working. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna spend all this money and I'm gonna work the whole time. Yes. So yeah, it's easy to get disgruntled if you don't make that investment back or if you don't make it back right away because a lot of times it will pay off later, but it, you know, you gotta you gotta have the capital up front to deal with that, which that, it's easy to get discouraged, and it's easy to have that become a more negative experience if you don't, if you know, it doesn't quite pan out for you that weekend. Yeah. So I can understand why some people get frustrated with it. Oh yeah, it's it's uh, it's one of those things. Like for me, this has really been like my first full year of doing the comic conventions uh, and kind of getting out there and getting a feel for stuff and just seeing the peaks and valleys and up and downs and just, you know, you have your good days and your bad days. Like, I I enjoy talking to the people going to the cons, you know, and, and just chatting with different people that I see at a lot of them. And, you know, like I catch up with you and Jeremy Flagg and, mm -hmm. you know, Sean and a bunch of other people that, you know, artists that I've gotten to know in to me, that part of it's fun, but then there's the interaction with the people that are, looking at your product. And let's face it, we are selling a product when we're at these conventions and we're trying to push our thing on them and get them to buy it. But it, it's it's interesting to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction with them, especially when they come back around after a convention or two when you see them again and they were like, oh, hey, you know, I read your, your book and it was awesome and blah, 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 and why did you do this? And I like this part. And that part of it so far has been really cool to me because now I'm starting to get a few of those people kind of coming back around and I'm hearing feedback from them one on one, which is right. Which That's is, always really cool. That somebody likes your stuff enough that they actually want to stop and talk to you about it. And it made that big, yep. of, you know, it made that big of an impact. That's that's an interesting, interesting thing. Um, so. So besides, you have you have the web comment, but you also have these out in book form, correct? You have two books or three out now? Right. Two books out now. The third one I'm hoping to have out this spring. I'm not making a lot of progress right now since I'm in the middle of moving. But <laughs> That would definitely slow things down. We were talking about that before, moving a family of yeah. four. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was starting to get ahead so that I could maybe actually meet this deadline, but that's kind of not getting anywhere right now. I'm sure I'll catch back up again yeah. once I'm done moving. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there's two books out right now. They're available on Amazon. If you want to support your local bookstore, they can order them as well. You know, it's published through, it's self-published through Create Space. So there's any avenue that any of those books are available, people can get them. Yes, and I fully support that. As I, too, am a Create Space artist, so... <laughs> <laughs> It's just so convenient. <laughs> it, it is. It is very convenient. I said it's it's got its ups and its downs and its flaws, but it's it's. I think it's the way to go if you're gonna go the independent publishing route. I think it really is one of the best options I've found. <laughs> looking around. Yeah. So. Um, now, besides Age of Night, um, are you working on anything else comic related, or uh, is it? Oh, uh, that's that's the only comic project right now. I've taken on other comic projects recent, semi recently, but nothing currently. Nothing currently. Now, right. Now you said you are the art director mm -hmm. uh, for Fearlight Games. Right. So that's my fancy title to make it sound slightly better than the entire art department. <laughs> really. Which is what I am. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, so I do. I. Yeah, I, I do all our layout, and I do a lot of the spot illustrations, the stuff that we don't, you know, buy licenses for or whatever, because we do actually hire and buy other pieces of artwork, but I do a lot of the artwork, and I do all of the layout and visual direction for the company, so. Um, for those who aren't familiar with it, can you explain and kind of go into detail a little bit about what Fear Light Games is all about? Right, so Fairlight Games, we're a tabletop RPG company, so, uh, well, gaming company in general. We're actually expanding out in the next year. We're going to have a card game as well, our first non-RPG product. Um, so RPGs, tabletop RPGs, role-playing games, for those not in the know. So think like like Dungeons & Dragons, but our games are, we have Baker Street, which is a Sherlock Holmes-inspired game where you get to play a Victorian Londoner and are trying to solve mysteries. And then we have Hood, 
where you get to play as one of Robin's merry men and go on all sorts of fun swashbuckling adventures and that system allows you to do all sorts of really cool storytelling stunt effects and that sort of thing. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I uh I was I I was an avid gamer for a very long time. I had a regular group we played once or twice a week, Friday every Friday night pretty much, but and then occasional Sunday afternoons if everybody had some free time to do stuff and uh, I miss I miss gaming <laughs> I really do but it's it's very time consuming and all the people I game with really don't live anywhere near me anymore so <laughs> I know that's that's the challenge once you're like an adult with responsibilities yeah, <laughs> it yeah. is very time consuming adulting takes up a lot of time unfortunately <laughs> it's it's but I've noticed like a few of my friends were talking about they do um basically they game through like Skype and stuff and oh yeah do, so that's kind of a cool concept and something I thought I've thought about you know trying to trying to get some of the old gang back together and maybe try doing it through Skype and that way we can even if it's just a couple hours a week I don't know if the days of 10 and 12 hour gaming sessions are in the cards so much anymore <laughs> right but, <laughs> no no we just gotta get through this quest we're, we're almost there seven hours later we're still not there <laughs> you know that sort of thing yeah but i always love like the camaraderie and just the 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 interaction with everybody the face-to-face -face interaction which i mean i'm a i'm a video game guy too but i don't quite feel the same uh I don't feel the same interaction with video games as I did with tabletop gaming. Right, and and I have actually done quite a bit of uh, gaming via Google Hangouts, which is practically the same thing as Skype, but I've done quite a bit of that, and it actually does recreate the sitting around the table with your friends feeling pretty well, actually. It, it works better than I expected it to. Yeah, and, and, and I was curious, and that was the thing that I've kind of been curious about is how well that, like, you know, it replicates the experience, or is it just basically, you know, you kind of still get that video gamey type disconnect where you're just kind of, you know, but I can see it being a little more interactive, I guess, because you'd be looking at everybody on your, you know, your webcam and kind of paying attention that way. <laughs> so, right, yeah. Yeah. Um, any other art projects? Anything you got going on that you would like to talk about before we get going into the movie section of Oh, oh, geez, I completely forgot. Oh, <laughs> this is I forgot to write stuff down because we were having so many issues here with with Skype <laughs> earlier. So, you just had right. you just had a gallery showing. Correct. Right, right. So, uh <laughs> there's this there's this little gallery called the Harlow Gallery in Hollowell, Maine, which if you don't know where Hollowell is, it's right outside of the state capital of Augusta. It's right in that area. Um and they actually had a group show called POW because we always have to do some goofy onomatopoeia thing when it involves comics. So it's a group show of a bunch of different artists. I think there are 34 artists in the show um, of all different types of either comics or comic-inspired art or that sort of thing. So you had some some images of just, uh, like, comics characters, uh, but a lot of actual comic art, a lot of actual comic pages. And I have several pages from Age of Night that are in the show. Oh, wow. um, so that was that was really cool, and I got to meet a lot of other main comic people that I haven't met through the convention scene, surprisingly enough. People that just hadn't hadn't really been a big part of the main convention scene, I guess, were off doing their own thing. So yeah. that was kind of neat to meet some new faces. Now, was that all main artists, or was it, like, New England artists, or...? It was, like, I want to say, like, 32 out of the 34 were actually main artists, oh, and wow. then there were, like, a couple of people from other states who somehow found out about this show. That's that's quite impressive, actually, that there is mm -hmm. that many people of that caliber, you know, in, in Maine. I just, Maine is so spread out, and it's so, um, it's so rural that it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's not the sort of thing you expect us to come up with. <laughs> no, no, and it's like, I've always said that, that Maine is, uh, like, 
trying to like not sound stupid in, in comparing this, but Norway is known for you know just having like a incredible amount of bands, and mm-hmm. and because it's cold in Norway all the time and it's dark and there's not a lot to do, <laughs> so you got to find things to do, right? You know, so I think I think that kind of isolation, I guess, is the best way to put it breeds creativity and I th- right. and I think Maine is very similar in that aspect that we are so rural and isolated because like up where I am I'm I'm pretty much you know you know you're pretty much smack dab in the middle of the state it's three hours up north three hours down south to get yep. to just to get out of the state <laughs> it's yep. a big state you know so you don't really get the um, you don't really get the uh, exposure, I guess, to all the different people that are artistically creative, whether it be writing or comics or right. We're all just hiding. We're, in we're our all own hiding in our own little towns. But then <laughs> that's one of the things that I always liked about you know that I like about the comic conventions is. Mm-hmm. That's like the few times a year everybody comes out of the woodworks and you kind of <laughs> right. Then all of a sudden it's like, wow, you're from the same town I'm from, and you went to school. <laughs> really? Wow, that's cool. And then, you know, and then so forth and so forth. And then, oh, hey, I know this person and this person. And it, it's so weird that we all know a lot of the same people, but then, you know, when we're all within, you know. You know, 50 miles of each other or whatever, but you don't even know those people are there. <laughs> right. That's that's just a that's just a weird main thing that I've always. I don't know how much it's like that down in Portland because to me Portland is like a whole other world. That's <laughs> you know. Right. Yeah. There's people actually like leave their houses once in a while in that area. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't you know I haven't been a regular Portland uh, goer for uh, since. You know, I, my band days, so it's been uh, been a while <laughs> since I've been down there. But that definitely seems like a whole different world when you go to Portland and then you drive 60 miles north of Portland and it's forest. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> yeah. so, you don't even have to go that far. You can you can literally go like 30 minutes and you're in you're in forest again. You're in the middle that, of nowhere. That is also very <laughs> true. So I was just down in Freeport recently, and it's like. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's like Freeport's a cool little town. There's all kinds of stuff there, but it's just like it's like just being in like a lot of other little main towns. It's just kind of pops out of nowhere, <laughs> and then there's yep. a bunch of stuff. <laughs> and you're like, well, I'm only like 30 minutes from Portland from here. <laughs> right. You're just driving along, and you're like cornfield, cornfield, pine tree, pine tree. Hey, look, Freeport's here now. Hey, a mall, <laughs> a bunch of stores. Hey, there's a desert. <laughs> Where did this come from? <laughs> yeah, it's just this. That's like up and down Maine is all like that. It's just it's, it's one of the be- <laughs> yeah. it's one of the things I love about the state, though. It's just it's so weird. It's because it's like forest, 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 town, <laughs> forest, 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 town. You know. Yep. <laughs> um. So. Have you ever, um, have you ever like uh, thought about collaborating with anybody else, or doing? You know, are you just pretty content doing doing your own thing and kind of going that route? Now, are you gonna try to do more of the gallery stuff? Um, the gallery thing just kind of came up out of nowhere. It was just a, a gallery that I happened to go to for life drawing sessions, and then I saw their like call for artists and they had this comic show coming up. So I was like, oh, sure, I'll submit to that. Why not? Um, and I have talked to people about collaborations before. You know, I've, I've, a lot of people, unfortunately, the biggest thing is that a lot of people who have wanted to collaborate on comic projects are not typically comic people. Right. So when I tell them, like, okay, sure, like, we can put together a pitch packet and shop it around if you want to, but in order to make a pitch packet, you need this, 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 and this. And they're like, what? I had no idea it was all this work. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, actually, comics are a lot of work. Oh, so. yeah. I, I, can ima- I, I can imagine, because you've got your story, and then you're creating the artwork for it, then you have to create the layout for it. And it's- right. So uh, a pretty standard pitch packet, for those of you who have not tried to shop ideas around to comics, 
mixed companies before. Uh, it's very typically they'll want if it's a multi if it's a multi volume or multi issue series they'll want an outline of the whole thing. They'll want the complete first issue script. They'll want a couple of pages, and the number will vary by by the studio that you're dealing with, but usually like somewhere between two and five pages completed of completed artwork. They'll also want like a bunch of character and concept designs for the whole thing as well. So that's like a ton of work for something that may or may not ever turn into anything. And a lot of people think that they just need like an idea. Right. And like one image. They, and it's like no. <laughs> they think it's kinda it's kinda a little different than like pitching a movie or pitching a book where you can give them a rough outline and just be like, here you go. You know, this is right. this is my yeah, idea. <laughs> Yeah, comics companies want to know that you're capable of delivering by having as much of it done ahead of time as possible. Yeah, and that and that makes sense, I think, because the comic world, while huge, is still it's it's a, I think it's a little more of a it's still a little more. Um, uh, I think, in my opinion, I mean, you have your companies, but I think it's a little harder to break into from an outsider perspective than, say, film or music. <laughs> you know, I think right. it's a little more closed off from the independent artist. At least that's the impression that I get from the little bit that I know. I haven't really kept up with my comic stuff as much as I used to, so I'm kind of not as familiar, but... Well, it depends on what it is that you're trying to shop around. Like, if you're trying to shop an idea to, like, Marvel or DC, yeah, that's just not going to happen. Right. <laughs> They're just not going to even give you the time of day. But a lot of smaller publishers will. The only problem is the smaller publishers don't have the resources that the larger publishers do. So they want to make sure that whatever risk they're taking on you, because anytime you start a new project or hire somebody new, it is a risk. They want to mitigate that risk as much as possible and make sure that it's a good bet. Which is why they want so much up front. Right, because they're they're I think they're probably looking at it as I want, you know, I want that sure thing that this is at least gonna break even for us and not Right, yeah. yeah. The, there's a there's a market for this. This isn't just gonna be like a super niche, you know, thing where fifty people are gonna wanna read it. And, <laughs> right. You know, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, they're not going to stay in business long if they only sell 50 books. No, so. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not at all. Unless you are exactly like Marvel or DC that has throwaway funds to take risk on things. and Yeah, I don't think most companies would be able to do that. And I think even Marvel and DC and some of them are starting to kind of tone it down a little bit <laughs> as far as just, you know, throwing out so much new stuff. At least it seems that way. The last few times I've glanced, you know, it's pretty much your standards. I haven't seen a lot of new influx, but like I said, I don't quite keep up with it like I used to either. <laughs> so... Right, I, I don't always keep up with the big two either, mostly because it gets exhausting. <laughs> yeah, I bought a few. They, I bought a few trade. When they have a hundred books yeah, running at once. Yeah, I bought a few trade paperbacks recently based on some recommendations from some of my uh, my friends. My friend Adam Cutler, who I had on oh three or four weeks ago, he uh, he's also a comic artist from Maine, and he um, we you know he recommended me a few like horror theme type you know books to check out so I checked out the cool. trade paperbacks because it's just I don't have time to do weekly and monthly I just <laughs> right. I'd rather just get it all at once be able to read it in one shot and be done with it so <laughs> it's just it's a lot easier for me just to, time wise and, and financially to do it that way mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, so is there any other um any other projects, anything you're working on that you want to talk about? So we are gearing up at Fairlight for another Kickstarter of having to do uh, a couple of adventure books for Baker Street and Hood. So that's something that I'm working on behind the scenes right now. We don't really have anything to show people yet since we're not live yet, obviously, but 
that's a lot of a lot of behind the scenes work of getting those ready to go. Oh, I'm sure a ton of planning. You, cause you're... Oh yeah, yep, planning and promotional images and all that fun stuff, and trying to get as much work done ahead of time as we possibly can, so that people know that the book's actually going to get done, <laughs> which which we've delivered successfully on every Kickstarter so far. But I understand why people are apprehensive about that. There are plenty of Kickstarter horror stories out there. Oh, I've heard a few. Yeah, with 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 bands doing Kickstarter for money and then never recording the albums and just you know, yeah. a lot of stuff like that. So yeah. I just went through like my first Kickstarter Indiegogo thing with uh, the company that's making the film adaption of one of my short stories. They Right, you know, right. So kind of seeing it that's just like I I've donated to a few Indiegogos and Kickstarters and things like that in the past, but it's always like I did the Mystery Science Theater 3000 revival um, Kickstarter, which you know I, I was like that's my favorite show ever, so I'm gonna do that. But I was still kind of like man, I, I'm kind of leery about just donating money because i it's been off the air for so long. And, right, uh, what's actually gonna happen here? Yeah, well, and then it took like a year from the time they did the fundraiser to let it actually come out, and it was just uh, it was. <laughs> But hey, it was worth it. I thought the new season was excellent, so I've watched it twice through. So I, so they did something right with it. <laughs> nice. But um, now I a uh, question real quick here. Like I know when my friends and I used to game, ninety percent of our campaigns were just fly by the cuff, winging it type deal. Mm-hmm. We used to do some mods, you know, especially with D and D and Shadowrun. We did a lot of you know pre. Pre bought, pre laid out mods, uh, mods, modules. For people who don't know, that means modules. Uh, <laughs> right. So, you know, we did that sort of thing. Now, with these, um, with the stuff you're doing for Baker Street and Hood, are you, do you guys play test those first to make sure everything's going to run out kind of smoothly, or is it just more of a fly by the seat of your pants type? Thing where you have, well, have the story down and then you work it out that way. Or I'm just curious because I've never really right. had somebody that's developed stuff that actually like gone right. to market. Well, uh, <laughs> ex- right. Um, well, each writer because we have a bunch of different writers for the different cases and scenarios. Each writer is supposed to play test their work before they turn it in. <laughs> Whether or not that actually gets to happen. Uh, uh, doesn't always happen, but pretty much all of us, pretty much all of us are actually also experienced GMs. Like we've we've all run these games, especially at this point. Like for the first for the first case book, which is our adventure book for our adventure module book for Baker Street. For the first case book, we definitely play tested stuff a lot more. But then as we're doing more and more of these, it's like, okay, well, we've run a lot of these games, so we know how these games go. Right. Like, we know where where your typical catching points are going to be and what works and what doesn't. Okay. And we will still try to make sure that they all get playtested before they go to print. But, uh, you know, real world, that doesn't necessarily 100% of the time happen. <laughs> oh, I, I know back in the day sometimes when we were running the modules, you know, we'd occasionally you would run into something in one of them and that just made no sense and it would get the group stuck for hours and hours on something because right. there was just like no not that you always need an apparent window but there was there was like you know most of the guys I game with are fairly intelligent guys so it was like one of us should have figured something out here by now we're not having it and then it ended up <laughs> You know, right. being something completely, like, off kilter, and a lot of times that would take us out of, you know, something we were running. It just was like, uh. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, and uh, with, with Baker Street, especially because it's a mystery, it's very technical, which is why we write so many cases to support it, because trying to come up with them at yourself as the person running the game is just, it's so much work. Oh, <laughs> it's I, so I much, can imagine. I, I It's so much work to come up with a mystery and have all the clues and all the moving parts and all the leads and what does everybody know and who was there for this thing. And so we try to do as many of those as possible, but oh my gosh, players will find a way 
to break anything. Oh. It doesn't matter how much you play test. Oh, it. yeah. You're going to have that, that one player that's just going to wander off into left field, and then it's really just the skill of the GM to try to bring it home. That's, <laughs> that's when you know you have a good GM, because the good people I gamed with were notorious for doing that anyway. You know, like pretty much everybody in the group at any given point in time could go off in left field and do something They're completely out of whack. And a good GM knows how to reel you back in and kind of work it out so it doesn't mess anything up too bad and, like, everything keeps running. But then they're slowly like, you want to go left. You want to go left. They're, like, subconsciously sending you thoughts going, go left. <laughs> I think I'll go left. You know, eventually you get to, <laughs> right. get to that point. Yeah, yeah. I, I only, you know, I, I didn't GM a lot when I... When we were gaming because that was never my strong suit. I just... I don't know. I I created at one point in time for D and D. I created up an entire like whole world that was separate from everything with its entire mythos and background stories and characters and, and mythical stuff and that was a ton of work, you know. And we ran it a few times and it was fun. But I was like, man, I am not a GM. I just I can write this the history and the story, but when it comes to the chaos factor of GMA. Right, managing players. Managing <laughs> players is not my strong suit. That's just not one of those things I'm good at. Now, my friend Andy was one of the best GMs I ever had. That guy, he knew how to he knew how to manage his players. He knew how to mess with people just enough to kind of get them to you know do things to think they were outsmarting him. And they weren't. <laughs> Most of them. You <laughs> right. know, he, but he he was one of the best GMs ever. And ninety percent of the stuff he did was right off the top of his head on the fly, and he just was amazing uh -huh. at it. And he'd start a campaign with nothing in mind and just kind of let us do stupid things and kind of <laughs> see where it takes you. See where it takes us, and some of the best stuff we ever did was just completely off the cuff, random, and there was no point to it when it started. But by the end of it, we had like the most epic quest ever happen and it was just I miss that that's the stuff that I miss about gaming is, is mm. that sort of thing but mm -hmm. so that's very cool uh, do you have any timeline for when that stuff's going to be out well the new adventures we're doing the kickstarter in starting the 19th of September and we're looking to have those out if not by the end of the year then really close at the beginning of next year because we have everything pretty well lined up behind the scenes. It shouldn't take us very long to finish them out. So so that's the idea on that. So, like, what has your, so far, like, what has your, uh, do you guys, like, have a timetable to kind of put out so many of these a year? Or is it just kind of as you guys come up with them? We've been trying to release one adventure book or one new system, or whatever. Just one thing. At least one whole thing every year. And this is actually be our second for this year, so this is kind of a little bit faster paced. Um, but since they are just adventure modules and not like a whole new system, whole new book, right. or whatever, it's a little bit easier to turn around. So yeah, we aim for one big release every year. Okay. Which is which is kind of an ambitious production schedule for a company made up of like four people. Uh, yeah, that's, that's quite <laughs> ambitious. Now... <laughs> Um, before we switch gears and start talking about the movie stuff, um, can you let everybody know where they can check out Age of Night and they can check, check out Baker Street and Hood and like where the websites are and all that good stuff? Right. So my website is ageofnight.com, and that's night spelled like the time of day, not like the guy with the sword, just because that's an element of confusion. It is a fantasy um, series, so I can see. <laughs> right, <that>. yeah. <coughs> right, so that's ageofnight.com for my for my webcomic. Uh, you can check out any of Baker Street or Hood, any of the Fearlight Games projects at fearlightgames.com or you can check out our Facebook page which updates much more frequently by just searching Fearlight Games on Facebook. Yeah, I hear you. I, I'm unfortunately awful about keeping my .com up to date on anything. It's <laughs> like it's almost like it, it's just it's such, so much easier to use Facebook. You're already there. It is. It is. I, it's almost like the .com is almost like an afterthought for me half the time. Unfortunately, <laughs> I like it because everything is kind of contained in that one thing. 
But at the same time, I, I just feel like the Instagram and the Facebook and stuff and Twitter just gets out to so many more people <laughs> than just randomly right. stumbling across on, on my dot .com. But I have noticed an uptick in the dot .com. You know, from doing festivals and conventions and, and, and that sort of thing. So, it's it's getting there. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, we were we were trying to figure out what to talk about, about movies, and I, I was uh, mentioning three of my favorite childhood era films was The NeverEnding Story, The Dark Crystal, and Labyrinth. And you also said you've seen those many, many times, so... <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I have I have all of them uh, on DVD, and I watch them many times. And they're really good to put on when you're doing other stuff in the background, too, if you've seen them a bunch of times. Because then you can just kind of listen along to your favorite parts and look up when you know something cool is going to happen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah <laughs> I, I, watched, I watched The NeverEnding Story way more as a kid. I didn't actually get to see the lab... I didn't actually get to see Labyrinth and the Dark Crystal until I was in, like, high school. But the never-ending story I watched many times as a child, even though it was mildly traumatizing. Okay, so I wasn't, like, <laughs> the only one as a child that was traumatized by that movie. Good. No, Good. no it was really scary at a couple like, parts. I, I can't remember how old I was when I saw that. I think I might have been, like, six or seven, maybe? Maybe? Oh, I don't I, even know yeah, if maybe. I was that old, but... The right. nothing scared the ever-loving bejesus out of me when I was a kid. Yep. That just was like, uh, what is this giant wolf thing? And it's just, ah, creepy as shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the wolf, uh, actually the, uh, the, what is it? The, um, the gate, the weird sphinx lady statues oh, yeah, that, yeah. like, <laughs> try to... To try to zap him with their eye lasers. That was the most terrifying thing. Oh, ever. when the night, when, when he sees the when he sees the the guy in the armor that had already gotten zapped and is like a corpse out in the desert, and I'm like, oh, is this a kids movie? I'm scarred for life. And, and that's the one <laughs> thing about all three of those movies. <laughs> like they're all fairly dark movies, really. I mean, the Neverending Story is probably the least dark of the three, to be honest. Really, you, you know, right. the Dark Crystal is. I mean, that's pretty heavy for, like, a younger kid, and um, Labyrinth has its moments of, like, that kind of creepy, weird darkness going on in it, but that is a little more uplifting because of the awesome musical numbers, so. Right. <laughs> a little bit more fun slipped yeah, in. Yeah, a little more fun slipped in, but the dark, the dark Crystal is actually my favorite of those three. That's the one I've probably actually seen the most, <laughs> so... So I want to get your opinion, like, I want to get your opinion on these films and, like, what what do you think makes them so, like, lasting and endearing to people? Because they still seem to be super popular, even today, and all three of those films are 30 years old. Right. Well, I mean, obviously you have to consider the whole nostalgia factor thing, which is a thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> right. But, I mean, the thing is that they are all just really solid fantasy stories. And so, like, in in Labyrinth, while a lot of it, for example, just as the first one to talk about here, uh, it doesn't have as developed of a world. It's very small scale, where it's just like, here's your, your you have David Bowie and his Labyrinth, and that's that's it. That's like the whole world. There's not really anything outside of that. But there are a lot of, like, there are a lot of theories about what's actually going on there and whether, like, where the, whether this is all just some hallucination and all of that kind of subtext that's going on adds a lot more depth to the story and strengthens it a lot. So since your core story is basically about Sarah trying to, you know, grow up and come to face the fact that she has to own her actions and her responsibilities, so... You know, with or without singing and dancing Muppets, that's a fairly <laughs> that's a fairly strong story on its own. But then you add in all this really cool stuff on top of it, and it's like, okay, well, that makes it interesting as well as being a solid story in its own right. Oh, it's, it, for sure, it's it's a 
it's a very interesting take on the coming of age story, in my opinion. You know, that's right. ex- that's exactly what it is. It's the coming of age of Sarah and her, like you said, having to realizing she has to grow up, and that she has responsibilities that she needs to take care of, and she can't kind of live off in her own little fantasy world. And and it has two of my favorite, like, puppeted characters ever. Ludo and Hoggle. So. Ludo, Ludo the best. Ludo, for, Just want a giant. Ludo friend. <laughs> <laughs> Just want a giant stuffed one to like use as an armchair. He <laughs> he like, like, that would be the best. He's like, he's like, he's like, all I can think of is he was like, he would be like one of those Disney characters you would run up to and want to like give a hug to. Because he just, I don't know, he just looks like, he's, he's not... He's supposed to be like the Minotaur type thing in the Labyrinth, I guess, is from what I kind of, I kind of, that was the, like the, I don't know, that's kind of like what I always thought. He was supposed to be like the, that sort of character, but. Right, but he's all big and cuddly. But yeah, it is like, I, he, he's not <laughs> being a menacing, he's just nice. And, nice. <laughs> and then you have Hoggle, who's like uh, the trickster, that's trying to get right. a, but even though he doesn't want to, when he's kind of fighting that moral dilemma. And, right, your your grumpy old man friend. And, you know, the Goblet King, David Bowie's, you know, manipulating him and the whole. So, and then you then you have the, you have the, the thing. And the thing about this movie that I always laugh about more than anything, and I probably hear more about it than anything. I don't know if it's just because I run in a weird circle of people. <laughs> if you hear the same thing as David Bowie's crotch bulge and that suit that he's wearing, <laughs> that's traumatizing for any child. So you know. Yeah, and it, his unfortunate tights. <laughs> Those unfortunate tights. Yes. Rest <laughs> in peace, Mr. Bowie. Nothing against you, but oh. yeah, not the greatest wardrobe choice ever for you know that sort right. of film. Costume designers should have maybe rethought that a little yeah. bit. <laughs> Yeah, this definitely is not a music video. Uh, maybe we shouldn't <laughs> go that route. But make make the shirt slightly longer. Make it more like a tunic. <laughs> and, and, but you know, getting back to stuff, the, that is the thing that makes Labyrinth so memorable to me is just the musical numbers. They really are. They're they're fun. They're just they keep, you can't help but like smile and be happy when you hear them. Right, it, yeah. You know, when dance magic comes on, you're kind of, you can't help that kind of oh, yeah. sing, nobody, sing along. Nobody can resist that, <laughs> that number. You know, I'll randomly see people, like, post something online, and <laughs> they'll be talking about something, you're like, the babe with the power. <laughs> and all right. of a sudden, you got 15 people, like, all just chiming in. It's like, everybody knows this one, whether they want to admit it or not, you know? <laughs> But that was like, there seemed to be in like that early to mid 80s, even like, I would say, er, you know, early 80s, mid 80s was kind of that golden age, though, of that like puppeteered type movies like The Dark Crystal yeah. and Labyrinth and, you know, even the never ending story. All the, all to the our practical sense, effects. But yeah, mixed in with the practical effects. And it was. Yeah. So. We had just thought about Labyrinth. Now, the, the, for those of you who've never seen The NeverEnding Story, <laughs> it's about a young boy whose mother has recently passed away, and he's kind of a bookworm and a loner, and he's he's kind of getting bullied, so he, he gets wanders into a bookstore and finds this book called The NeverEnding Story. And he kind of locks himself in the school and is reading it and kind of goes on an adventure, and it's... it's that has one of the most gut wrenching, heart breaking scenes ever in in, oh, no. in a kids movie. You probably know exactly what scene I'm talking about. Yep. So I'll let you take it away. You... Uh, the swamps of sadness. Oh, so where, awful. Li- <laughs> right, where like literally every time we watched it as kids, we'd be bawling. Oh. And- because the because the horse gets taken by the swamp. And, he, and the kid that played a. Tr- uh, the train yeah. I mean, is just like it's such a it's such a good performance. Yeah, he's very very clearly like in serious distress at this horse slowly being eaten by the oh, swamp. Just, which I mean, it's not if you haven't seen the movie, it's not graphic or anything. The horse is just slowly sinking into the mud, but it's really traumatizing because the horse is just 
standing there slowly sinking, and the kid is like losing his mind and trying to get his horse to move. It's such a realistic and, portrayal. It is. It's so <laughs> right. It's such a it's such a realistic portrayal of that like grief and frustration, and it's like really emotionally impactful. You know, whether or not you care about the horse, <laughs> like it's. His performance is so good. You're just like, oh my gosh, no! And, and that's the thing. You got Bastion, you know, kind of like reading the story and then looking through the eyes of Atreyu as you know mm-hmm. the story's going along, and it's it's such a cool concept for uh, a movie. And I, for the longest time, did not realize that was actually a book. <laughs> and it was, mm-hmm. I didn't I didn't even realize that till about four or five years ago that that was actually a book, and it wasn't just a movie. The book came out before the movie so yep. <laughs> and I guess it's it's the book is a lot darker <laughs> and, and different than the film from what I've heard oh jeez I don't know if I can handle that <laughs> <laughs> so but you have Falcor which is also one of my favorite like puppeteer type characters of that you know that time period I that's like one of those ingrained childhood memories of Going to my sister's house, because I'm way younger than my sister. There's 16 years age difference. So going to my sister's house and, like, watching that on VHS over and over and over when she would babysit me and just, like, eating popcorn yeah. and just freaking out every time, you know, the nothing comes up. And I actually, the wolf isn't actually named the nothing, is he? It's been a little while since I've seen it. Uh, Gr- Grimorg, something yes, like that? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, he's he's trying to uh, accelerate the nothing process, and the, yeah, it's <laughs> but excellent, excellent. And I guess they made a part two, and I never saw the part two, so I don't know. Oh, it was not very That's good. That's probably why I've never seen <laughs> it and like never heard anyone talk about it. So. I I I've, I saw it several times, and it had some interesting parts, but it's not no. good. It's not good at all. No, I saw it <laughs> no. in the bargain bin at Walmart once, and I was like, I'm, I am I kind of want to grab this just to check it out, because I'm... I'm uh, <laughs> I mean, if if you really want to, and it's in, like, the $3 bin, I mean, sure, go for it, but it's One not One of those, good. like, you're going to probably watch it once and be done with it forever, and be like, uh, right, no, I'm right. just going to put this aside, and I've had enough. Right, because it's not one of those ones that's, like, super bad and fun to riff on because it's super bad. It's oh, just yeah. not As good. I always <laughs> say, there is good cheese and there is bad cheese. There's, you know, there <laughs> yeah. are some movies I could be very forgiving with because they're unintentionally hilarious and awesome in unintentional ways. And then there's the ones that are just cheesy and serve no purpose whatsoever for <laughs> anything and just bad. <laughs> so... Yeah, unfortunately, it falls more into that latter oh. camp where it's just like, oh, this is just kind of an inept so mess. It's, oh, well. that's something <laughs> I would love to see, like the Mystery Science Theater guys take on is, is something like those are the types of films I like when they can really get those really right. bad stinkers and just kind of go with it. But <laughs> um, so the last film is, like I said, is probably my favorite of the three, and I actually just. I had never owned a copy of this film. I watched it probably 50, 60 times, but I've never owned a copy of it. And I actually found a copy on DVD not too long ago, and that's The Dark Crystal. Uh, mm-hmm. Easily the darkest story of of the three. To me, it is the most, like, uh, I want to say, like, hardcore fantasy of the three. Oh, yeah, definitely. It definitely has the most, like, actually built-up fantasy world and mythology and everything around it. So much so that, I mean, uh, who is it? Is it J.M. Lee that's doing the comic or graphic novel series? Right, yeah. And that's actually not even the first uh, graphic novel series. They had another one a few years ago um, that I don't don't remember what its subject and, like, which part of the story it was doing, but there was another comic series several years ago as well that have spun off of it. There's there's been a lot of supporting material for this movie because the because the concept is so rich. There's so much that can be oh, built off of. Exactly. There's so much depth to like the backstory of Jin and Kira and the the Gelflings and the, the whole the pod the Podlings <laughs> there's there's all those cool little cool little like um 
you, you know, I don't want to say creatures because they're not really creatures. Um, Demi human races that that mm-hmm. are that are out throughout that, and then you have the Skeksis and the, uh, mm-hmm. the ancient ones. There, I can never remember their exact name. Uh, I, I would <laughs> just call the ancient ones. But you know, yep. and then you got that, and the whole thing with the crystal shard being shattered, and you know the the whole story. And that one, and the one thing that I loved about this film was the music that accompanied the film. Really set the yeah, tone really, for the scenes. Yeah, it's a really good score. There's, it's it definitely it definitely conveys really it conveys mood really and well. It's not one of those like a lot of films nowadays, especially seem to go a little over the top with the score at times. I think <laughs> this, the, the right. score for bah, oh yeah, I mean it's appropriate bah, 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 if you're watching bah, bah. Star Wars or something, you know, like Lord of the Rings that's like huge and epic and. But the Dark Crystal, for as immersive as the world is, is really pretty contained, even though they are, you know, going on a journey. But you spend a lot of time in the in the cave, you know, the, the tower the Skeksis are in, and then mm-hmm. the rest of it is kind of, you know, Jin with the, with, with the Ancient Ones, and then he kind of, you know, there's a little bit of a travel, but you don't see a lot of the world while he's traveling. <laughs> you know. No, what one forest set, one little desert set. Let's not build too many sets here. This is already an expensive production. Oh, I production. can only imagine. <laughs> and there's some really cool bonus stuff on the DVD, if, you know, that I enjoy because I love bonus material on movies. That's one of my yeah, all the making. Oh, that's up. one of my favorite things on how they how they do that stuff and and. Uh, but yeah, so. The Dark Crystal is is darker than the the three, but it's it's uh, it's always been my favorite of the three, and it's just I love the story and, and just the 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 visuals, even though it's all puppets, it's so beau it's such a beautiful film, and it's just yeah, it's one of those. It's like I've heard a few people talk about it being like possibly remade or redone, and I'm just like. No, that's no. that's that's one of the ones I really think you need to just stay the hell away from. There's not too many movies. Leave it alone. There's a, there's only a handful of movies in my book that it's just like you don't ever remake these movies because they're pretty much perfect the way they are, and uh, that's one of them. And along with Jaws is the other one that I'm I'm dead set against anybody ever remaking that film. I'm going to be very angry. <laughs> so right, <laughs> but um. So, you know, it's it, it's such a cool it's such a cool dynamic in the whole thing, but it's it is really a very dark movie, and it's it almost has some horror elements to it. I you know I think you know like this oh gosh you know yeah. the skeks he's trying to suck the life force out of the the pod when yep. to drink their essence. <laughs> it's just like for. It's very messed up. That's very it's dark. Jim, it's very dark for it's children. It's a Jim Henson movie. You know, the dude that made the Muppets. So, you know, <laughs> right. it's a very, and it, you know, and it's but the voice acting is awesome. You got Frank Oz in there, mm-hmm. Ruby Goldberg, and just all these different people, and it's just such a fantastic voice cast. And uh, I miss I miss a lot of those movies like that because you just don't see that sort of thing done nowadays. I realize it's probably so ungodly expensive and time consuming. Right. But <laughs> but the, yeah, you really don't see a lot of puppetry anymore. Everybody wants to go CG. I th- I want to say probably probably the closest successor to that sort of thing would be the stuff that like Leica Studios is doing. Which did you know their stop their stop motion? Which type did they would. Good boy that did Kubo and the Two Strings, correct? What yes, a amazing yes. movie that is! Oh, I love I that just, movie. I was, I, I saw it in the theaters, and I was like, the very first scene, I was like, oh my god, I almost cried. I'm like, oh man, I'm in for quite a ride on this one. I knew absolutely <laughs> nothing about that film other than like I hadn't seen any previews, no trailers, anything. I just knew a few of my friends had been like, dude. This is such a good one of my favorite animated movies I've seen in years. So good, mm-hmm. you gotta check it out. And I'm like, yeah, I'll get to it, whatever. And I was scrolling through Netflix and I added it to my queue. And I finally watched it the other night, and I was just like, wow, this this yeah, is so, so good. good. <laughs> the the voice acting is incredible. The animation is 
And that's the thing. It's stop motion animation, but you don't really yep. even realize it. it. It's it's so seamless and just, oh, yeah. it's so gorgeous. And I'm kind of wondering if they blend stop motion and traditional animation. Um, they do enhance a lot of their work with CG. Like, they use CG to kind of, like, smooth out a lot of the a lot of the rough edges and they use it to like do a lot of the background effects and that sort of ah, thing. Okay. But but the bones of the animation is still entirely done stop wow. motion. That's that And they're still they're still building like all of those little characters and all the sets and all the props and everything. They're basically just using CG to kind of smooth out the it's, cracks. It's amazing because like I said, I you know, you look at most stop animation one of the best examples would be Tim Burton stuff with like uh, The Corpse Bride and mm-hmm. um, A Nightmare Before Christmas. You can tell those are stop motion animation films. Uh, right. I guess yeah. I couldn't tell. I just was like, it was mm-hmm. just so beautiful and so well done. And and you get so wrapped up in the story that I don't think you, you know, I'm almost, I'm a, almost a 40 year old adult male and I got so wrapped up in that story that I was just like, yeah, What's going on? Really What's happening good. next? And, <laughs> and I loved Beetle, and I loved just you know the monkey, and just, what are we going to call him, boy? You know <laughs> why are we going to call him boy? You know, and it was funny. I found right. myself like laughing out loud several times during that film, like, and it was touching and just. Oh yeah, I, I mean, part of what I liked about that setup too is that it was actually a family story. Like the entire family was the center of the story. It wasn't just about the little, the little boy and the parents are off nowhere, or it wasn't just about the dad, or it wasn't just about the mom. It was about all of and them, it, and it all came and together, including the part of the family that why don't we have contact with grandpa? <laughs> right. You know, that whole, yeah. <laughs> that, I don't want to give away the the movie. For, if you haven't, if you are listening and you have not seen Kubo and the Two Strings. Just put down whatever you're doing. Finish the show first. And when you're done with the show, go get it on Netflix and watch it. And you're going to thank me. And you can send donations directly to the average Jewish page. <laughs> and then, but, you know, it's, uh, yeah, and it's, I don't, like, I, I'm a sucker for, like, the Pixar movies and stuff. And mm-hmm. I love the Pixar movies. And I love I love anime you know I love animated films anyway I always have ever since I was a kid and I love you know the puppeteering things and the stop motion and all all of that stuff so I don't care I I watch Moana you know that was awesome too I love Moana that it was, was. <laughs> you know The Rock was in it so that was cool because I'm a huge fan of The Rock oh excuse me uh, the um, so yeah, so it's like I'll still check out stuff like that. See, I've never seen Coraline, which they also did. Correct. Oh my gosh! Yes, you need to yeah, see yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. I will, I, I, is oh, that on Netflix? So good. You know. Uh, I'm not sure. I have that one on DVD, so I haven't never, bothered yeah. trying see, to find I, it. I for some reason always thought Coraline was a Tim Burton thing. I don't know. I don't no. know why, but yeah. I did, and I just. It's it's got a similar aesthetic to it, but it's it's really good. You'll okay. enjoy that. It, I don't know if I had to say that it's as good as Kubo because it's it's very different, but it's really I good. I have to check that out then. And the only reason I even knew that they did Coraline was my friend Eric Marner uh, does a podcast called The Movie Freaks, and they were talking about you know showing horror films to kids and he was talking about showing that film to his daughter when she was fairly young and it like broke her brain you know because it was just <laughs> yeah it's pretty scary <laughs> in a few parts so, another one of those like you intend to show this to children are you sure about that and that's the other thing you like look back at the dark crystal and the never ending story and labyrinth I was like the threshold for what our parent well our parents generation would show their kids to like the threshold of what I most of the people I know would show their kids are very different. You know, right. I I watched some movies that I you know thinking about back to the thing now. It's like I probably was way too young to watch that when I saw that. You know, but maybe that's what you know pushed me towards my warped brain of how creative brain. I don't know, but you know, it could could be good or bad. I guess, but. Yeah, I don't know right. if I if I had kids, I probably would be not quite. Yeah, probably not going to show you that movie till you're like at least ten or eleven. You know, <laughs> right? Maybe we'll Maybe wait a little. We'll wait bit. a little bit. I also 
my sister when this you know tells my age, but my sister got a um, my dad before we even owned a VCR rented one back in the day, and there was uh, he brought home Poltergeist and Flash Gordon. Uh, oh jeez. I wasn't supposed to watch Poltergeist, but I kept walking into the room where my sister was watching it. And kept in that in the scene with the clown, I think I've mentioned this other show before. I can't remember, but you know the scene with the clown and Poltergeist is like still traumatized me to this day. I, every time I think of that scene, it just freaks. Ah, gives me the willies. <laughs> yeah, you know, but it's just it's just weird that that different generation and, and that whole thing and. So and you have little kids, so you know that's a, that's that's one of those things you're gonna have to come up with that. Oh my you, gosh! You know yeah. what should I not? I mean, should I show to my children? <laughs> right. I mean, and every kid is different too, because you never know what sort of weird thing is gonna be the thing that they're just like, oh, that's funny. That's not scary at all. Versus, oh my god, that was the most traumatizing thing ever. Weird, weird <laughs> you know? things can traumatize. There was a scene. That, Flash right. Gordon, not really the scariest movie, but there was a scene in Flash Gordon that scared the crap out of me when I was a kid. He, like, falls on some spikes, and I just was like, oh, I was mortified of that, you know? And it, right. Even though it was yeah. cheesy looking and not that good, but, you know, looking back on it, that kind of was like, what the hell, you know? But So, anyway, wow, we are up to almost an hour and five minutes on the show, and it's about time where I usually like to wrap things up. So, uh, thank you for coming on and chatting with me. And uh, one more time, you want to give everybody the websites to check your stuff out? Sure thing. So, you can check out my comic at ageofnight.com, and you can catch up with Fearlight Games at fearlightgames.com or on our Facebook page. Awesome. Once again, thank you very much for coming on and, and bearing through all the technical difficulties to get going today. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, it <laughs> well, happens. Thank you very much for having me. Definitely, and uh, good luck with the upcoming releases, and hope everything goes smooth for you. Thank you. You are listening to Average Joe's drive and Thank you guys so much for coming on and checking out the show this week. Um, tomorrow, if you are listening to this, which would be Wednesday... I should be seeing it tomorrow afternoon, so I will have my friend Pete on with me, I believe, and we are going to discuss it and what we thought of it, and it should be pretty interesting because Pete has never read the book or seen the first movie. So, should be very interesting perspective. You can check us out on Facebook at facebook.com backslash Average Joe's Drive-In Podcast. Also check out thomaswashburnjr.com. Look me up on Instagram, Thomas Washburn Jr., and interact, talk, leave messages. I like that sort of thing. Don't be scared. I don't bite hard. I will see you sexy animals on the flip side. Thank you once again. You have been listening to Average Joe's Drive-In.